Hello, this is News for Scotland. I'm Hugh Stewart, and this is Jeanette Hill, and here's this week's news for the second week of April. We're going to begin with the economy. The Fraser of Allen Institute, Strathclyde University, has been looking at consumption trends. Consumption means ordinary spending by you and me on goods and services and normal things we buy, and also not just goods but also intangibles like holidays, uh, software, insurance, things like that. So all consumption is a very big part of the economy. In fact, it's sixty percent really. So if it, if consumption is not growing, it's unlikely that the economy is going to be thriving. Now we've I've looked at a paper by Joe Souza uh, of the Fraser of Allender, and he's, first of all he's graphed the um, consumption trends over the last thirty years. There had been a steady increase up until the banking collapse. So years 2007-2008 was followed by a recession, big drop in consumption then. After that, it was gradually picking up again until 2019. And not surprisingly, it collapsed during the COVID years, 19 to 21. Since then, a small um, upturn. Real consumer spending, however, is only 3.6% higher than it was uh, back in 2007. So really, our spending has hardly grown over that long timescale. And since 2019, after the COVID recovery, the last year, few months it seems to have dropped again. Now, the last downturn can be explained by taxes. Whatever the UK government says with its famous tax giveaway budget last March, then we are actually paying more in taxes. So it's, uh, you don't have to be economists to realise if people's taxes are increasing, their take-home pay is down, and so their consumption spending is down. So not surprising. Another couple of aspects of this consumption survey... And in, in 1857, Ernest Engel, as I'm sure you know, Jeanette, um, argued that food as a percentage of our spending will, will tend to go down as we become richer. In other words, the families rise up through income scale. They don't need to spend more and more on food. There comes a point where you've had enough and you start spending your money on other things and fun things. So what that means is that if you expect uh, the economy to, to be doing well, if people are improving their prosperity, you'd expect the proportion they spend on food to be falling over the years, but guess what? If you look at the graph, it's pretty flat. Over a long period of time, people spending on food as a percentage isn't really changing. So that, again, is an indication that people aren't doing too well. Now, just finally on consumption, one interesting point to note is that we're spending less on transport. Before the pandemic, we were typically spending about 14% of our incomes on all types of transport, public and, uh, and private cars. But now, comparatively, we're spending about £500 a year less and uh, from 14% is down to 12.5%. Now, those are just the figures. We don't really know why that is, but uh, is it an increase on people working at home, uh, which, of course, a lot of people took up uh, during COVID? And if we are spending less on transport, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, next story on bees. Uh, if you were listening to us on the, the Spotify, uh, uh, the That's audio it. version mm-hmm. last week, yeah, it goes out on Spotify on Podbeam and various other platforms. Um, so if you haven't heard that, you can pick it up again. There was a story on bees last week. The bee population is under threat by the yellow-legged Asian hornet, which is in Yorkshire. So will it make its way up the A1? <laughs> now, that's a notifiable uh, uh, creature. Is that, is that the right word? Is that, anyway, if you find one, you're supposed to um, report it, and you can find out who you reported to on last week's programme. Because I didn't make a note of that. There's, um, there's a hotline. Put it on Facebook, don't worry. Right, okay. <laughs> now, but this week, though, we've just heard that uh, another threat from the um, to the bee population comes from a disease. It's called the American Fowl Brood, or AFB. Now, this disease has been picked up last week in a uh, beehive in Perthshire. So uh, any beehives within three kilometres of that one are, are asked to be very careful with their biosecurity. That means to watch what goes in and out of the bee- beehive, both bees and equipment. Now, it turns out that, um, I didn't notice, Jeanette, that, but there are about 1,400 hobby beekeepers in Scotland who are members of the association, the SBA, and so they should be notified of outbreaks of the, the disease, the AFB. However, there's probably also about 1,000 beekeepers who are not members of the association. So the Scottish government says to them, whether you're a member or not, could you get yourself informed and you can register with um, a site called BeeBase, and then you can hear if there's any infections in your area. And, of course, if you're unfortunate enough to get one in your beehive, uh, you need to r- tell people about it. Now, um, I don't have a beehive. I don't know anyone who does have a beehive, but bees are incredibly important. Uh, throughout the world, 75% of our food, that's fruit, uh, nuts, vegetables, depends on pollinators such as bees. So um, they really are inc- crucial to keeping us all alive. So we have to look after the bees. Okay, enough on bees for this week.
Uh, Palestinian protest. Now, in a couple of minutes, Jeanette's going to talk about um, um, a talk to Hamza Youssef, well, an interview he gave the other day yeah. to the BBC. So let me begin with Hamza Youssef's position on, on Gaza. A couple of days ago, he wrote to the um, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, demanding an end to arms sales to Israel. The First Minister pointed out that British-based companies continue to arm Israel in spite of the growing death toll among children, women and medics and aid workers. Describing these deaths as intolerable, the First Minister said the UK government would be complicit in the killing of innocent civilians if it doesn't stop. Mr Youssef previously wrote to the UK Prime Minister on the 23rd of February but has yet to receive a reply. Protests against the Israeli army's attack on Gaza did take place across Scotland last weekend and we observed three in Edinburgh last Saturday and some of the footage of that will be on our um, YouTube channel. We'll tell you where to find them later on, Jeanette. Now, one group I spoke to staged a protest outside Barclays Bank in Princess Street and they were citing that bank's financial backing for various arms exporters such as BAE, BAE Systems and Elbit Systems. Barclays, I was told is invest, investing globally over four billions across the arms trade. One, sec, uh, one member of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign in Scotland told us that it's bombs from America, the UK and Germany which are being used to commit what he called genocide that we see in our televisions. The campaign, which has seen, he said, a groundswell of support, wants to go further and demand a boycott to Israel and calling for an immediate ceasefire. The Scottish Socialist Party also held a protest and a petition signing activity just along the street and I spoke to former member of the Scottish Parliament, Colin Fox, who told me that public the public response was overwhelming. He said they haven't seen um, this sort of public response and enthusiasm for a campaign since the referendum. He told me that people want a ceasefire and want the killing to stop and the talking to begin. He added that there is no military solution if there was, they would have found it in the last 80 years. People, he says, are listening to this argument and, and he feels that the UK parties, Conservative and Labour, uh, should realise that they are out of sorts with the British people. Uh, Labour, he said, won't move and won't demand a ceasefire because they're terrified about, um, you know, following the expulsion of Jeremy Corbyn, they're terrified about, about being labelled anti-Semitic. But he says that Israel does, of course, have the right to defend itself, but they don't have the right to kill 33,000 innocent Palestinians. Another protest shortly afterwards on the Waverley Bridge in Edinburgh uh, was led by trade unionists, and among other things, they read out the list of, um, well, the death toll among the medics, doctors, nurses and other aid workers. OK, so all that took place in Edinburgh last week, and I've got more later on. It was a busy day in Edinburgh. Do you want to... Move on before I come back to that story. Sure, do you want yep. to talk about? I just want to talk a little bit about um, our, our first minister's uh, interview mm-hmm. on hard talk by Stephen Sacker. Just because we know lots of people in Scotland don't uh, uh, subscribe to the BBC, but I thought you might be interested in hearing his um, his half an hour on uh, hard talk. Hard talk is a BBC World News um, debating interview. Um, notoriously uh, hard. <laughs> Stephen Sacker is a, a, a journalist of some repute, Cambridge educated, but you know he has uh, lots of experience of, of, of world journalism in different areas. Um, but he doesn't ever give whoever's on hard talk an easy time. But I felt that um, Hamza definitely stood his, stood his ground and, and did well. They started off, of course, with the police investigation, as they always do. Uh, we never seem to start off when we talk to um, Westminster uh, ministers or cabinet ministers about their police investigations, but it always seems to be the, the SNP one. Anyway, and he, and he also said that polling shows the SNP votes are likely to be down, um, the party's going to lose. And uh, the First Minister... Um, sort of counteracted that by talking about record levels of um, junior doctors joining the Scottish uh, NHS, uh, children out of poverty in Scotland and how much better we are in those sort of figures than um, than the rest of the UK. Um, although very quickly, uh, Sacker took them back to investigating fraud and um, highest drug deaths as soon as uh, health was mentioned, he, he mentioned that and um, uh, First Minister went on to talk about 
what they how they were trying to tackle that and how it was difficult because it was it was Westminster um, policy. Which well, was dr- making... drugs policy is uh, yes. uh, covered by the Food and the drug, Dangerous Drugs Act 1971. I think that's the it. Scottish government doesn't have any no, say that's over it. that I mean, at all. They have a great deal of tro- trouble to change things when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, but he did say it was it was an issue of concern, and they they wanted to 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 stop it. Then he went on to talk about a big furore that's been happening all over YouTube and everywhere else. I think is the Hate Crime Act, um, and it, he actually was, Stephen Sacker said uh, Scotland was at war over it, which I thought was a bit sensationalist. <laughs> and he discussed J.K. Rowling's uh, arguments and her comments on things that the police got on degree did not meet the threshold for um for for calling it a, a hate crime and um said something about transgender activists thought that it should uh, according to saka i don't know he didn't quote who he was talking about there but he he was saying that people are transgender activists are saying that roland's comments should be um considered as part of the hate crime that the First Minister disagreed and said, obviously, it had to be um, at a certain level, just like we said last week, I think we talked about the hate crime bill, mm-hmm. didn't you? It has to be a certain level of criminality before you can intervene, makes it reasonable. Again, they brought up his old speech, which um, lots of uh, fairly right-wing, even Sucker agreed that they were very extremely right-wing, uh, some of these um, YouTubers or commenters were bringing up the old the old uh, speech that, that Hamza Yusuf gave on talking about how few BAM people there were in, in prominent positions in Scotland. He was using, that speech was used, as he said then, at backing up um, the Black Lives Matter campaign and saying, yeah, let's look at Scotland. It wasn't saying Scotland, we know, is a predominantly white country. He wasn't saying it, in, people of colour had to take these positions. He was just pointing out how few people of colour there were in those positions. And to me, it didn't seem like a... It's up to you listeners, but to me, it didn't seem like a particularly racist speech at all. He was just pointing out facts, you know, as far as I could see. Yeah, um, I'll, have, I'll have to actually look at that in context. I've yeah, only seen yeah. uh, on YouTube, uh, yeah. well, people who are criti- critics of the Scottish Government yeah, often yeah. show a wee clip of that. Yeah. It, it, Hamza talks about how... Yeah. How many boards are, are all white? But I mean, I'd like to look at the whole speech. As you said, that was several years ago. It's not a thing he, he no. does, says every week. No, but they always right. drag that up. <laughs> they do see me on the as a way of criticising the hate crime act. He did talk a little bit about um, the making complaints, even though it's, he can make a complaint, even though, like you said last week, even though it might not go further to be um, considered a crime, you can make a complaint and he said that came from the Stephen Lawrence um, inquiry recommendation and that's that's mm-hmm. why personally I've heard an argument which I thought was quite good, we could do similar with rape and sexual sexual abuse, we could do a similar kind of system because we know that rape and sexual abuse is so rarely um fully prosecuted, you know, really successful, you know, um, maybe we could do a similar thing and maybe they'll look into that when they're, when they're looking at the misogyny, which they haven't done in this one, they're doing it separately. That's right, there will be a bill on yeah. make to uh, make misogyny a, a crime. A crime. Yeah. That is going, well it's not in the parliament yet, but yeah. it will, will be I think this year. And then he went on to talk about Gaza and he's discussed that some of his wife's family were there and he said it's beyond imagination what's happening there um, and he was, I thought, visibly upset by it um, and it was, for me, nice to see uh, an actual one of our leading politicians in this country making that comment and he said uh, we needed to stop arms sales right away like you, you said, the uh, UK government had to stop it and that if they didn't, they were complicit in the war crimes. And it had, it was no doubt in his mind, he said there was plenty of evidence out there to show that this is war crimes. And I think the people of Scotland in the main seem to agree with him on that one. And obviously his response to the October Hamas attacks was that that was absolutely beyond horrific. There's n- no question about that. But he was saying that the, the Israeli response to that was beyond a reasonable response. And it was... Uh, you know, um, fallen into the into the war crimes um, part. He Sakir, um addressed um, 
um, our First Minister's uh, visit to Turkey, saying he overstepped the mark there, according to Lord Cameron. And he um, quickly said, no, he didn't. He was completely and utterly entitled as, as a Scottish First Minister to talk to other governments. He wasn't allowed to sign treaties and he never was intending to do that. And he had asked Lord Cameron to have a discussion on this, but as yet he hasn't taken him up on that offer. And then finally they went on to talk about the mandate for independence and, and they said um, he was saying that at the next election if the SNP wins then we're really looking at that's a, that's a mandate for a referendum that the UK government should allow us to have that referendum. Um, uh, but he actually said quite nicely at the end he said they won't allow us to have a referendum he said because they're feared that we may win. <laughs> I thought that was quite a good way to end it and uh, he, hand- he handled it well he was measured and uh, he answered his questions and he came across to me I'm not a, a, a massive fan of him but to me he came across as, as, as a very reasonable politician and um, in the UK we don't have that many these days that we can say that <laughs> I know we're in a period of um, a lack of personality. Yeah, we will discuss some of these points later on, but just it just occurs to me right now is a bit ironic that the unelected Lord Cameron is telling the elected uh, First yeah. Minister of Scotland that he's uh, absolutely is uh, not in his place. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we'll come back to that anyway. We'll have a chat, a discussion, the two of us at the end of this show. Let's just quickly go into the next story I covered in Edinburgh. This was also last Saturday. Uh, the Let Women Speak public meeting. Uh, this is uh, one of a series of meetings run by Kelly J. Keane, the women's rights cam- campaigner. And it's really a kind of um, open mic, I think you would call it, uh, she, around various cities in, in, in Scotland and England and also in other countries. She takes a sound system, really. She uh, introduces uh, and then she invites people to speak, uh, usually women. Um, in fact, I think I don't think there was anybody else who wasn't a woman uh, who spoke last uh, Saturday because I watched the, the whole thing, in fact. And we do have some video of it. That will either appear at the end of this programme or it might be in some video shorts on the YouTube uh, version. Uh, but Jeanette will tell us, you, you know more about that than I do, so you can explain the YouTube coverage. Uh, so very quickly, um, Kelly J. Keane said, uh, introduced the act, uh, the event, and uh, invited women to speak, and she makes it clear that um, what they're all about is they don't think that uh, men can transition to be a woman. That's really what she says, and then other people are allowed to come up and say whatever they want. Uh, only women. Uh, many of the people speaking, uh, again, spoke out against the hate crime bill, because what they were concerned about is that if, if a woman says, for example, that a trans woman, uh, a, man, a pers- person transitioning from being man to woman, wants to get into a women's club uh, or any place, which w- or women's changing rooms or a women's sport team, uh, the women all said, no, you're, we've got the right to say no, we don't think you're a woman. Incidentally, there was another demonstration there, at the same time, well, it wasn't a demonstration, I must say that the, the women always said, uh, we are not a demonstration, we are a meeting. Trans rights campaigners had a demonstration against the meeting. Um, now, the police uh, in Edinburgh had divided the groups into two, so before everybody arrived, uh, crush barriers were set up, and uh, the Let Women Speak campaign was on one side next to Prince's Street. Uh, this was at the Mound, by the way. And uh, the uh, protesters against the Let Women Speak event were at the other side, sort of facing towards the castle. The protesters mainly played pop songs through a sound system, did karaoke singing. But there was also one or two speeches. And one one uh, speaker, who was an academic, said that um, the reason they were there, because they think women and feminists need to widen out the definition of women to include people that used to be men, but who have now chosen to be women. I'm not making any comment, I'm just telling you what they said. So basically that's the division there. The Let Women Speak campaigners, they're saying, no, we are women, we were born girls and we're now women, and that's it. Um, and the other group think that whether you're a woman or not is a matter of choice. It's flexible. So what do you think? Right? As um, as Joanne Cherry puts it, is sex immutable? Are you stuck with the sex you were born with? Or is sex a matter of consumer choice? I guess that's what they're saying. Anyway, the, um, the event took place peacefully, although very noisily. I'll just finish before I move on saying that although there were supposed to be two different events, uh, one group of uh, mainly men who were next to me um, start, uh, turned up right next to the women's uh, uh, meeting and uh, they made a lot of noise. They had loud halos set on. You know that siren sound you can make an emergency siren setting <laughs> and it just bleeps and makes this uh, really loud noise. And they had a couple of them 
And in between they would chant, and what they were chanting was that Kelly Jenkins a Nazi. I didn't see any sign of any Nazis there. And um, I was saying to the police, surely you move these guys along. The demonstration is supposed to be up there, but these, these young men have mainly came here to drown out. Uh, they made it perfectly clear. They were there to stop people hearing the women from speaking. Um, so um, that, that's just what happened, right? So mm. there might be more than that, because I've, um, I've raised that question with Police Scotland. Why didn't they move these guys along? Because they just they stood right next to the cops and didn't uh, say anything. OK, so there should be some video of that as well. Uh, that will maybe show you at the end, or it might be in the shorts. So, OK, so, um, uh, Jeanette, uh, have you got that piece on the WASPy campaign, something yeah, we've talked well, about previously? It's not really particularly WASPy. It's a little bit WASPy, mm. but it's really about... Because uh, one of our um, contributors to the Facebook page said we should talk about... When we asked, what do you think we should talk about? They, sh- they suggested we talk about the incredibly low state pension um, that we have in, in the UK. Obviously, it's Westminster that decides the UK state pension. It's not a Scottish government um, decision. So a wee bit about WASPy be- debate because there's a motion tabled by Patricia Gibson, SNP MP. Um, she tabled it last year. And it's happening on the 16th of April where there'll be um, a debate on the compensation um, that the Ombudsman has suggested and also there'll be a vote at the end of that. And whether or not waspy women, women born in the 1950s that had to wait from 60 to 66 to to get their state pension, whether or not they're entitled to um, pay compensation. Uh, and I believe next week you'll be out at Holyrood again, maybe interviewing some of those ladies that are going to be out there. Um, mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. We should uh, take the camera out there. Yeah. We'll definitely do that. We're going to be out there. Um, demonstrating on this issue, keeping it in the forefront. They've done a great job um, getting out there and be keeping this fight up. So um, the fight is to get state pension for many women, as we know, because for many women, it's their only source of income in retirement. It's quite different, really, um, from lots of men. So it's especially true this of working class women, women that have had jobs maybe that started as a cleaner in the health service or whatever, but that job was contracted out or whatever it happens to be, and suddenly they find themselves 30, 40 years down the line, and the only pension they've got to look forward to is their state pension. They yeah. don't have anything, anything else. Uh, and that's especially true if you look at women through the 60s, 70s, 80s even, uh, 90s even, would you believe, who worked part-time because of the caring um, responsibilities that they had either for their children or disabled family members or indeed older family members. It's massively women who do this free caring work. They maybe took career breaks as well. They went back part-time. I remember when I was working part-time um, as a, a lecturer all those years ago, we were in England and we weren't allowed to join the pension scheme until you got mm-hmm. a permanent job and that was many women were in that situation and so accessing these if you like employer pensions or private pensions is a difficult one for me for many women i spoke to somebody recently and they said oh, i don't know what the big issue is because i'm 60 and i'm getting my pension so why are these waspy women um, shouting out but of course she was talking about a civil service pension which she wasn't talking about the, the the state pension, and she didn't realise that she was in a privileged position to have that because mm-hmm. really loads of women don't have that, and that highlighted to me the massive difference um, between people who will have employer pensions, private pensions, whatever they have, and those that are relying on the the state pension. And I kind of that was the sort of thing that was brought about by Thatcherism. Really, it was like we won't raise the the state pension so much unlike what they did in Spain and Germany etc that was the main pension for everybody you know it goes up and down depending on income it's not dead easy you compare pensions across Europe but Thatcher was more oh no you will have a separate sort of um, pension that that's, that stands out from mm-hmm. your your state one that well you're they, they, they want it to be have. run by banks don't yes, they, they want it was, to create a market was. opportunity for financial sector that's exactly what it was it was a massive opportunity for hedge funds etc to use this pension money which um they couldn't really do if it was just our, our, our contributions our wi contributions so women are about twice as likely even now 
even currently, that um, to just be reliant on the state pension twice as likely, yeah? And obviously, if you look historically, it's a much bigger gap, much bigger gap. But even now, yeah, we're still looking at. So what does this actually mean then, this gender pension gap? So is even if you get your state pension, you, you make it to 66 or 67, which is very much dependent on your social class, but never mind that. Um, what Have you got enough to live on? So let's see. So now if you get the maximum, and you might not get the maximum for a whole variety of complex reasons, but say if you get the maximum, it's about £220 a week, even with the increase that we've just had in the budget. You got a thirteen pound increase in the budget. That's about eleven and a half thousand a year. Now, they say, in order to live, you need about twenty one thousand a year, and that's what they're saying is the is the living wage twenty one thousand. So, if you're only living on state pension, you've got about half mm. the living wage. So, can you can you actually manage to? pay all your bills and buy your food and have any kind of reasonable living on that. That's what loads of pensioners are saying in, in Britain, is we forget about the people who are really just dependent on their state pension. Yet they might in, in be, as long as they don't have a little tiny bit of private pension, they might get pension credit and they might also get some housing benefit, council tax benefits, etc. They may get these. These, of course, are, are means-tested benefits. But we've got 12 million people in, in Britain living on the state pension. And while it's true that some have other pensions, over a third of those women on state pensions don't. And many of them are in expensive rented accommodation, especially if you look at like Edinburgh or Glasgow, mm -hmm. the cities. Mm -hmm. And if you're paying rent, your housing benefit will not cover all of, all of that rent. So you have to find, say you get some allowance like, £500 a month if you're lucky if you're over a certain age uh, towards your rent and your rent is actually £750 £850 a month on a private which is perfectly normal in a private rented accommodation then you're going to have to have to find £300 a month or move out move in with your children can't imagine that my, my son's going to go hysterical if he hears that <laughs> me moving in with him <laughs> So many um, that, are, that are on minimum wage, even many of them are on that 21000 a year, are struggling to pay food, heating, uh, the rent has gone up, etc. So how do we think our pensioners feel? Yeah, yeah, it's true, they get free bus passes and that, that is great. And we used to have like community meals and all that sort of stuff, but many community centres are closing down because of energy bills, really. Um, but these services are absolutely essential for people to... to to stop isolation, to improve their diet, to get a good meal there, to stop you sitting living in, in a cold flat, which isn't great for your arthritis or your, your heart condition or all that sort of stuff, yeah. And if we don't give our pensioners a reasonable amount of money, and that's the argument that I actually heard recently was made in Spain, um, that people accepted was, if you've worked all your life, you're entitled to a reasonable mm -hmm. uh, um, living. We're not talking about, uh, you know, a massive luxury but you're entitled to be able to have enough luxuries to say that you know your old age isn't going to be a grim one yeah so and they keep we keep hearing this idea that we're all living longer we hear it so often oh you know they talk about the what did they call it the age um sort of like the bomb the age bomb oh we're yeah, yeah going to the, be, the pop population that's time it, bomb. that's it that's, that's the sound right we're all, that's <laughs> it but actually it recently horrifically to say that um we have we stopped getting older and older and living. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you look at longevity as well, it's very much broken down in terms of social class. Yeah, yeah? your social and economic conditions that you've lived in, were born in, and lived in all your life affects how long you're going to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're looking at poorer folk living less long, paying into these pension schemes. You know, the state pension schemes, paying into your national shares. And really, is it wealthier citizens that are benefiting from that? I've heard that before said that um, the pension's just an extra tax on poor people to to let, to give to rich people when they they live longer than us, mm. maybe. <laughs> but yeah, there's a transfer from one group of the population to another. Uh, in some ways, it maybe can be. But um, so I'm just saying, 
please check on your older relatives because if they're living on such terribly low amount of money, make sure they're getting everything they're entitled to because loads of people haven't applied for pension credits and they're entitled to it. And it's fairly easy to apply for pension credit. Attendance allowance is a bit harder as a ridiculous form, but if they've got a range of needs, whether it's arthritis, whatever they happen to be, heart troubles, whatever, they may well um, be entitled to attendance allowance. And if they get attendance allowance, they're obviously entitled also to pension credit and extra help with their rent or other things as well so it's a very good idea to check that they're getting it and if you don't know how to check that get the Citizens Advice Bureau mm-hmm. or find like um, we know that North Lanarkshire has got a great social inclusion unit and they will check through people's mm-hmm. benefits and I'm sure lots of other um, councils up and down our country have got social very overworked social inclusion units that will help check people's pension and they're very happy to do that because we do have a problem with old age and poverty and uh, poverty makes growing old pretty hard I'd say it's, yep social class um, hasn't gone away and uh, that's something maybe the incoming Labour government ought to think about Jeanette um, I did hear Keir Starmer recently saying that um, um, well he's saying he's making an appeal to the working class when they launched the local government um, a campaign in England a couple of weeks ago and uh, he was almost saying, he didn't use the S word, he didn't say socialist, but he was always saying that, you know, um, putting demands of working people first is now going to be a Labour priority. So uh, let's um, remind him of that then if he becomes Prime Minister. Now, who's going to do the next story? I've got the, the cast story. Do you, will I do that now? Then you've got Go on. the ballot. Okay. <laughs> now, this is breaking news today as we recorded this show. We just heard it literally a couple of hours ago about the release of a long-awaited report called the Cast Report. And this is um, a report compiled by Dr Hilary Cass for England and Wales. So why are we doing it in News for Scotland? I think we'll, you'll see this is going to have an if I am its impact in Scotland, and it has begun to do it this morning. I don't know what people have been saying in the last couple of hours since we've been setting up the recording, but it came out this morning. Uh, so what are we talking about? This is um, the final report into children, children's gender health services in England and Wales. The interim report was already published a couple of years ago, and that led to the closure of the GIDS clinics in England, who were the place uh, that uh, children were referred to if they were engaged in, in some sort of gender distress, if they felt they were born in the wrong body, and then they were sent straight to the GIDS, well, not straight, there's a big waiting list. The equivalent in Scotland is the Sandyford Clinic, and they also have a big waiting list, but that was the, the specialist dealing with that kind of uh, patient. However, the interim report from Do- Dr Cass already had the, cl- the GIDS Clinic in England closed, and also led to the announcement a few weeks ago that puberty blockers were not routinely to be given to children in that category. The Scottish government um, didn't do anything about it at the time. They said that's an English report that's got nothing to do with us. And as far as we know, they haven't made any statement today about the full cast report. The health report, the health policy, of course, is fully devolved to the Scottish government. So in a sense, they're quite right, of course. The decision of the English um, NHS uh, doesn't have any legal effect here, whatever. However, the same policies are have been followed in Scotland and in England. So if those policies have been questioned in, in England, maybe they should be questioned here as well. Uh, Dr Cash's report reveals uh, that the previous practice of treating gender-confused young people was not based on adequate research. In fact, the clinical guidelines used throughout the world have in fact flouted, flouted medical standards that are in fact based on poor evidence. And that's the opinion of the BMA who have given their Im- immediate response to the report today. Many countries have followed the advice of uh, that organisation called WPATH, which is a controversial organisation led by a coalition of medics and uh, trans rights campaigners. A University of York report cited by Dr Cass found evidence that, that f- they found that the research used by WPATH was, in their words, wholly inadequate. The evidence on the effectiveness of gender affirming care and the long term evidence of the effects on a patient's fertility, bone density, heart health, and indeed improved satisfaction uh, with your body following any modifications. Uh, The evidence is either lacking or inconsistent. Megan Gallagher for the Scottish Conservatives this morning called for the use of puberty blockers to be blocked in Scotland. And uh, SNP Member of Parliament, Joanne Cherry KC, said today that the cast review had utterly vindicated the reviews of a, a campaign group that she supports called the LGB Alliance, Lesbian and Gay Alliance, 
adding that politicians who had called them a hate group should hang their heads in shame and read the report. We haven't seen any comment yet from the Scottish Government or from the Scottish Green Party. The NHS Scotland has been following the WPATH affirmative care approach. Will there now be a change in policy? I've got one more story, which is on the football. Have you, are you, uh, Jeanette, were you going to cover... Um, I was. Balloch Highland Games. Let's go to Balloch. Yeah. <laughs> so on the Scotland Welcomes You website, you'll find a list of Highland Games in different localities. Um, so they describe them as a range of piping and drumming competitions and individual pipers and drummers. And uh, some caber tossing, that's my favourite. <laughs> Highland dancing, athletic events. So great fun and great food and, and drink may be taken and combined with the grandeur of the Scottish scenery, it says, and the games are a must-see for visitor attractions. I think most of us would, would agree with that one, with that um, definition on the Scotland Welcomes You website. So it's understandable that the cancellation of the Balak Island Games has met with dismay from the locals. Most of Balak Park in July usually has a Balch Island Games, but it's lost its 14,000 council funding, so can't take place. Um, Some people are sympathetic with the council saying this tight, budgets are so tight and they've got priorities, obviously, in social care and things like that, which are taking precedence precedence over um, things like, you know, Highland Games or other festivals. The council seems incredibly sorry about what they've done. They know it's an unpopular decision, but they say cuts, uh, budgets are stretched so far. It's harsh, obviously, for the many performers, including the youngsters and volunteers who coach them uh, in the dancing and the music. Often they do this out of their, for their own, out of their own time in their own pocket, you know, as well as for the athletes. It's also a loss to village businesses, as visitors were around nine thousand last year, and Balch is a renowned tourist destination. And these games take place in the middle of the school summer holidays. Loch Lomond Highland Games Committee made the decision to cancel after the news of the Western Bartonshire Council cut to the budget. But it's here's hoping they can run it next year and they're hoping to find alternative um, funding because festivals and culture events like these are part of our inheritance, wouldn't you say? And are, and are good for our youngsters and our communities as well as good for tourism. I remember seeing one last year in Kirkcubri and all the wee tiny, tiny lassies that were doing the Highland dance they were absolutely beautiful so they were, and the boys following um, a few guys um, they were mainly boys there were some girls in it as well uh, doing the drumming and the pipe band and I thought that's absolutely fantastic that these kids are, are getting this opportunity and we're getting the opportunity to see it as well so I hope they do find the funding and it comes back I certainly hope so. I only went to one Highland Games myself last year, which was Kermunnock, and that was great fun. Um, I did intend to go to others, but there's always something on. But uh, see the Kermunnock Games, it's just a wee one, but there was um, loads of people there from all around the world. I met Canadians, I met mm, Germans, you will. Met people from the Czech Republic, you know, and uh, all I'm saying is that uh, if they think it's a stupid way of doing funding, doing accounting, you know, you think this is costing money, it's not, it's making money. But there just isn't any way of tying it up. Obviously, yeah. local businesses are making money from these business yeah. visitors, but it's not helping the council. Right? So well, it's, it's crazy economics. We've got something that's good, which people enjoy, and it's benefiting the economy, and we can't afford it. Now, that's just nuts. You're right. Uh, you're right. But I, f- I feel for the, the council, because it can understand they're really stretched, and they've got, you know poor wee women that really need somebody to come in and help them get under the toilet and help them get washed and everything. Yeah, and yeah, they've got to prioritise their funding. So it's, yeah. OK, today are we about done? Will we just do the football now? Go on for your okay. football. Uh-huh. News for Scotland doesn't regularly do uh, football because we, we don't know an awful lot about it. But um, I'm, I'd like to suggest that we start covering the Scottish international women's team because they, they don't get enough coverage. And they could do with some more support, I'll tell you why in a minute. Anyway, I was at Hamden last night to watch the Scottish women against Slovakia. And uh, this is the second Euro qualifier in this campaign. And we won 1-0. Although the game was fairly dull. And it adds to a a goalless draw last Friday, uh, which I wasn't at. I was in Serbia, but folks say it wasn't much happened then. Certainly any goals. Um, Pretty dull football, but still the manager, Pedro Martinez Losa, is very pleased to have four points from two games. 
And he says the team is on their way to the finals in 2025 in Switzerland. OK, so they've made a start, but um, although I'm, I'm no expert, but I think they need somebody who can score goals, you know. <laughs> Um, okay, now what the other important point uh, to remind you of last night uh, is uh, in last night's game, Rachel Corsi, our captain, received her 150th cap. Yay. There's some smashing team players in that team, but um, I don't know what, what they need to do to make it a bit more exciting. <laughs> and we find that there were about 3,100 in, in Hamden, and uh, so we were among them. So uh, previously, Hampton Games have had over 5,000, so um, the Scottish team has been on a poor run recently. So let's hope those four points uh, and um, the fact that we're now doing, I think, second in the group uh, means that uh, people will be encouraged to support them. Just finally, before we move on, as we came in, we picked up a leaflet from a couple of folk who were saying, uh, these were Palestine protesters again, they were saying, Israel's in Scotland's group, we should be boycotting, we shouldn't be playing uh, football, and they're saying... Well, everyone's boycotted Russia because of their invasion in Ukraine. The Russian team can't take part. Uh, Russian athletes have to perform individually, but not officially as Russians. Uh, sort of saying, if you can do it to Russia, why can't you do it to Israel? Again, I'm, I'm just telling you what happened. Uh, what is your opinion? That's mm. what we saw last night. So I think that's um, those are the stories. Mm. We'll just uh, mm. chat over some of the yeah. issues that come up. Yeah, go on. Let me see. What, what did we say, first of all? That was uh, 20 minutes ago or something. The economy right, and um, consumption. Uh, some people are skint, right? That's that. <laughs> people are skint. They certainly are. It's funny you said it about the food, because I thought people's food bills have, like, doubled, because they really have, you know, if you, I think I noticed ketchup the other day uh, was, like, £5 or something. That was crazy. Obviously, that was some crazy shop that I can't go back to. But um, I think food bills have really... Increase, but you're saying not maybe uh, as a proportion of. I, I've just realised right, something yeah. actually. You've just pointed out a flaw in the argument. If you like, just, <laughs> yeah, the idea, the argument is as, as I said, if people get richer, they spend less as a percentage on food uh, and yeah. more on uh, holidays and so forth. Yeah. But of course, one of the reasons why that percentage isn't changing is because of food inflation. So uh, that, yeah. that's definitely an element of it. Yeah, right. Because it certainly has. That's yeah, what people good, say. Good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Their um, food bills have doubled, their mm -hmm. heating has doubled, their rent and mortgage has went up incredibly. I, I mean, absolutely. You really are in a crisis. <laughs> now, I, when you were talking about the interview with uh, Hamza the other day, uh, I, it strikes me that they, they always ask the same question. So Stephen Sacker is a mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. part renowned interviewer, of course, yeah. and uh, it's called Hard Talk. He's not g going to give you an easy no, ride, yeah, not sorry right. should, but... You could have predicted what questions he was going to ask, couldn't you? He's going to talk about drug deaths. Mm -hmm. He's going to talk about the um, the um, legal actions, and he's going to uh, what was the other big point he talked about? All the investigation constantly going on about that, and mm -hmm. um, what drug deaths? Yeah. Yeah. Now these things are not unimportant, though. No. But um, those are always the things that, mm -hmm. um, that the yeah. mainstream media singles yeah. out uh, because, well, they see. Uh, I, I think it is true. They yeah. look at what's going bad. And they'll say, right, we're going to talk about these items, right? There might be a dozen things that are going very well, but we're not going to yeah. talk about them because this is hard talk. Right? Yeah, true. But to be fair, the, the First Minister really held his own. He, he came across well. I thought, oh, I thought, I'd like to hear what other people think. MD else has saw it. I know uh, that we watched the BBC because uh, we pay our licence. <laughs> because uh, my man is addicted to BBC News. <laughs> He's got to watch that. So I get to watch that, but I know lots of Scots don't for a, a whole variety of good reasons why they don't, you know, uh, support the BBC. Um, but um, I actually thought that wasn't too bad, an interview. I mean, I've seen him attacking people more ferociously. But yes, I, it was the same. We knew those questions were going to come up, the same stuff. It was well prepared for them. Though. Mm -hmm. He handled himself really good, and I thought it was quite good at the end saying... Uh, the UK government won't give us a referendum because they're feared. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's per I think that's perfectly true. Right? Um, so let's just go over that point again. We think that. I've you might not, that. but we do. <laughs> uh, so, well, I'm glad you you gave such a thorough account because I'm one of those people that uh, doesn't pay the BBC licence. <laughs> so, well then. Uh, oh, incidentally, before I move on, just to remind you, last... Last week on the Spotify thing, we talked about the Scottish football not being on the Scottish television. So oh, that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of the BBC. But somebody said on Twitter yesterday that the Scottish television, STV, covered the football last night, but not the Scottish football. Apparently, you could. Somebody said on Twitter, is this true? Somebody said you could watch the Irish game on the Scottish TV, but not the Scottish game. 
Uh, what is wrong with broadcasting in this country? <laughs> well, that's why we're here. Especially when it's called STV. <laughs> well, that's why we have news for Scotland. Now, just before I move on to another point, I've just realised you were going to talk about a blue badge. Hold oh, on, yes. Uh, just a, a reminder from one of our, our, our listeners, actually, just to say everybody should check your uh, date on the blue badge because sometimes people forget to check it and it goes out of date and there's like a thousand pound fine did she say something like that some crazy fine that you could get so if you're a blue badge holder um, please make sure you check it's in date and apply before because it's taken a wee while to get that so make sure you've applied um, a good few months before it's it's expires yeah okay right right, right. so let's get that uh, remind people of that uh, have we got time uh, for any more discussion Huh? Well, okay. what else? What's your, what's oh, your burning? Going, I, I was just going to go back to the Hamza and the oh, yeah. um, the question of the. Well, as he, as he said correctly, there isn't going to be a referendum. Nobody in Westminster is going to give a referendum, and I, uh. I guess he's right because the um, it would probably be a yes vote. I would think the support for referendum is something like fifty percent, mm. and uh, it depends on how the campaign goes, of course. But yeah. uh, if you remember. When um, Alex Salmond agreed to uh, with David Cameron <laughs> to hold mm. the referendum, that was agreed in 2012, and then the referendum was in 2014, support for independence was at 25%, mm. and that's mm. why Cameron agreed to it. Mm-hmm. At the moment, so support for independence is somewhere between 45 and 50%. It, sometimes it goes to 52%. It depends what polls you look at. But there's no chance that London is going to agree to a referendum if there's a good, fair chance they could lose it. <laughs> So that's, that's definitely not going to happen. But what do you think of this uh, idea then that if we win the election, we, we're going to... Well, I thought that the idea was that if the SNP win this election and if they put independence on a manifesto, that itself means you don't need a referendum because the people have just voted for it. I think it's going to be really hard work to make that happen. Not that we won't maybe get an SNP you know, majority, but it's just that it's going to be hard for us to prove that that's... That means that we have the right to and then uh, declare independence or have a referendum yeah. or whatever. I just well, think it's it, going to be difficult. I think it's about international support, isn't it? If, yes, a, if a country maybe. does, uh, if a country, well, look, look at Catalonia, for example, who declared independence and are not independent. It's not a country, though. <laughs> we are a country. But they're they're a, a region. I, but, well, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. We are a country. Uh, now, the thing is, uh, you have to have international support, that's what I'm saying. Aye, so the main absolutely. reason why Catalonia isn't a country is because nobody recognised them as a country. It's never been a country. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm all for Catalonians having their independence, whatever, but I mean, Scotland has always mm-hmm. been a country, so it's kind of a different position. We've got a stronger position, you know, I would say. That, that, yeah. That's true. I think <laughs> there is a difference, yeah. But it's about, um, well... It's about international recognition. So, mm-hmm. if if mm-hmm. let me give you a scenario then. So, so supposing uh, the SNP won either election, either the Westminster one or a Holyrood one, mm-hmm. and for the first time, because they've never actually done this before, for the first time, if you actually say uh, right at the front of a manifesto, mm-hmm. which everybody gets through the doors and the dollar leaflets, it says vote for SNP and we will declare independence. Yeah. If it clearly spells that out. Mm-hmm. And then if either if we win the majority of MSPs or MPs, mm-hmm. or else if we win 51% of the actual numbers of people who vote, mm-hmm. then um, I would then say, yes, declare independence and mm-hmm. right to the United Nations, right to the European Union. And as soon as somebody says, yes, we recognise you and we're going to send you an ambassador, <laughs> it could be Emdi, it could be Macedonia, it could be Patagonia, it could be Iceland. As long as somebody says, yes, we're going to send our ambassador to Edinburgh, you send your ambassador over here, as soon as one person does that, one country, you're then recognised. You've then joined the community of nations. There's a scenario for you. Do you like that? I too? like your scenario. <laughs> I like it, yeah. I don't know if it's going to work, but I like it. <laughs> but the weakness of it, of course, if you don't get if you get 49% of the vote, then it doesn't work. And, of course, if the SNP doesn't win 40 MPs in the next election, if they, okay. well, one opinion poll says they're going to win 41, another poll says they're going to win 19. Mm. So there's a fair chance it's not going to happen anyway. All right, what do you think of that? Let us know. Let us know. Please do on our Facebook page, News for Scotland. If you put News for Scotland all together in an at and in front of it, you'll find us easy enough. And you'll find us the same way on YouTube, but you can find us it's on our Facebook page, how to get to our YouTube. And uh, this show will be out on YouTube on Friday and also out on Podbeam, which goes out through Spotify. I mm-hmm. think, yeah. Uh, yes, I do That'll the audio That'll be a sound edition. one, yes. Uh, I was just going to go over the... Yeah, it's Podbeam, if you um, if you have the Podbeam app, that's yeah. uh, the one that's... They host 
the stuff. Yeah. And uh, but a lot of people don't have the Podbean map, but you can also find our, uh, our audio version on Spotify yeah. and on Google Podcasts. And it's also on Amazon Podcasts. Yeah. So yeah. The audio version is in various places. And the Jeanette says, uh, from now, from this week, you can find <laughs> us on YouTube. Uh, okay. Indeed. And uh, thanks very much for, for watching us. Okay, and just yeah. before we summarise on the YouTube thing, I can also, uh, Jeanette, I didn't discuss this with you, but I think we should uh, thank the rest of the team. Tony's here pointing the camera in the oh, right yes. direction, so thank you, Tony. <laughs> and Yvonne's not here, but Yvonne's busy doing the paperwork. Very she important, she says. Yeah. And thanks to Sean for editing and producing the video. Absolutely, and thanks to Glasgow Caledonian University uh, podcast studio for allowing us in and, and being fabulously and inviting and welcoming. <laughs> okay, so obviously you're watching this on YouTube. Um, there will be some other YouTube uh, clips. There will be some of the um, roving reporting that we're oh, doing. Oh, yes, there will. Uh, and yeah. I think some of that will be at the end of this show and some of it is also going to be on wee YouTube shorts. So uh, uh, just keep looking for them and we'll, we're hoping to do them every week round about Scotland. Uh, it's news for Scotland, it's news for where we are. Thank you very much.